In scripture, the Holy Spirit always comes on our breath. So as we begin this morning, I invite you to take a deep breath. To think about your breath as it moves through your body, as the presence of God that also moves through your body, your soul, your life, and into this world. May our worship today reflect the Holy Spirit and be a part of empowering us with what we need. And I'd like to invite the choir to come and begin us. Good morning. <clears throat> Please stand if you are able for the call to worship.
wild and free, creative and refreshing, God's Spirit blows through this place. Come, Holy Spirit, gentle and mysterious, patient and caring, God's Spirit moves in our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, breaking barriers and making connections, healing divisions and making us one. God's Spirit flows between us. Come, Holy Spirit. Please open your hymnal to number 280 and we'll sing verses one and two. Right, I'm going to ask you to, you can just set your hymn book down because we're going to sing that one again in a minute, but um, sorry, now that you all close it. <laughs> um, as Presbyterians, we always want to be prepared, so, you know, um, we're going to do that, but together we're going to first tell the story of Pentecost, so I'm going to invite you to do that, so if you have your hands free, that will be helpful. So this is how it's told in, the, in Acts. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place, all being the people that had been following Jesus. They were all wondering what's happening, and they were all sitting together. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. So I'd like to invite you to make a wind noise. Sounds really cool. Keep going. And then they saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So as we continue to listen and make this wind sound, I'm going to light some candles. I'm going to light a candle for... Mary Magdalene, who I sure hope was in that room with all those guys. We'll see how the wind allows me to do this. Uh, okay, one more try, and then we'll just light imaginary candles. All right. Mary Magdalene, thank you. Keep going, keep going, don't stop. Peter, thank you, Amy. Later, the Apostle Paul, who wasn't in that room. And I invite you to, who are the people that you know who are lit with the Holy Spirit in this world? Could be someone you know or someone you know of. Call it out. Yeah. <laughs> 
I heard Pastor Deborah from last week. Thank you. Who else? Bobby. Mm. Who else? Oh. All right. Who else? Saint Mark. Can I hear that? Children of our church. All right. So the Holy Spirit lighting flames of fire. And there were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed and saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. They were all surprised and bewildered. And now you can stop the wind. Some asked each other, what does this mean? And the others jeered at them, saying, they are filled with new wine. So left side of the congregation, you are, what does this mean? Show me what does this mean. And say it out loud. What does this mean? What does this mean? And you all over here get to be, they are filled with new wine. They are filled with new wine. All right, let's try it again. There we go. But Peter raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, these people are not drunk. After all, it is only nine o'clock in the morning. (laughs) Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young will see visions, your elders will dream dreams. So if you consider yourself young, I invite you to put your hands on your eyes like binoculars. (laughs) And if you consider yourself a little old today, and I've got some aches and pains this morning, you can stand up and make, or you can stay there and make a motion like you've had an epiphany. All right, so I'm going to read this again. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions, and your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my spirit, servants, men and women, in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. Amen. So let's continue to sing, Come, O Spirit, dwell among us. Hymn number 280, verse 3.
right. Now I'll let you sit down. Thank you. The second reading for this morning is from probably what's my favorite chapter in the Bible. Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it. For us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirit and confirms who we really are. We know who God is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get exactly what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with Christ, we're certainly going to go through the good times with Christ as well. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. So I'll uh, get right into it this morning. Why does church matter? (laughs) It uh, has been largely deemed irrelevant by people around us, a little bit out of touch, If you ask a lot of young people today, they'll say the church and Christian faith in particular is one of the primary barriers to justice and flourishing in the world. In addition, it's been a place of pain for many people. It's an uphill battle to do church. The decline of religious affiliation feels antiquated. I read a um, little you know, if you know, follow Seth Godin at all, he sends out pithy little notes every once in a while that are kind of profound. And yesterday's was, you may be interesting, but people aren't interested. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, ouch. <laughs> um, and the truth is, for me, um, I did not want to get into institutional religion either. And uh, I grew up in a very religious home, very deeply faith-filled parents, uh, was in church as long as I can remember, and uh, went to Christian high school, Christian elementary school, Christian college. I was a missionary. And uh, so I and I had had... um, a lot of different experiences in the church. Um, I met my husband, Chris, when we were doing a house church, starting a house church. So we met with a group of people, didn't have any um, church forms except for just discussion of the scripture. And that was my attempt to kind of get out of church (laughs) for a while. Then I helped start a church and... um, As I kind of began to grow and change and how I understood the Christian faith, we left that church and had a really painful experience of what they now term getting ghosted, where no one calls you and follows up. Um, But I had all these questions about how this faith that was so real for me could be made real in the world. And so I kept reading kept studying, a wise mentor and friend said to me, you know, you really should try seminary (laughs) because this is odd for someone to have this many questions about these things. So I went to seminary and ended up with a a master's of divinity, kind of to my surprise, still not wanting to be a pastor, even though that's the degree you get when you're a pastor. I wanted to teach and continue to think about how this could be different for others, but I didn't think the church was the right place to do that. Um, But then um, I thought, well, if I could find a church, 
that I felt at home in, that I felt like was doing new things, that was interested, that wasn't putting me into boxes, that gave me space to continue to explore scripture and what God means and what God means in this time and in this place, then maybe I would be a pastor. So I um, ended up becoming a pastor up at First Presbyterian Church in Bend, which I always wish you all could meet each other because we have similar hearts. They have what they call a spacious Christianity, and I was able to help develop some of that. They had a, they had a cafe downtown Bend, Oregon that was a um, nonprofit cafe, and anyone could come eat. They were doing all sorts of interesting things. They were really out in their community, and that was a place where I grew and began to kind of fall in love again with what it means to be church. And, um, and then it was time to take the next step, and so this is where I ended up almost five years ago. Can you believe it? On a much... No, <laughs> It was just a lot hotter that Sunday in June than it was today, and I'm so grateful that I'm not up here dripping in sweat like I was on that day when I candidated. Um, and again, it was the same thing, like, this is a place that's willing to do things differently. This is a place where things we can shake things up. This is a place where we can listen to what the Spirit is saying now and now and now. And this is a community that wants to go there together. So I love to be in these places of possibility. And I've come to know over time that actually I need worship. I need to come here on Sunday mornings and sit and have something refocused for me. I need to be in a larger story than just the one I can create, even as beautiful as that, so I might think that story is sometimes. I need a community. I need to be with people who are different than me. I need to have voices that are, go beyond my newsfeed and my best friends. I need a text and a tradition and a path, and I need you, and we need each other. And I believe, and I'm still learning, that the Spirit meets us in whatever form this church thing is. God still shows up in groups of people, even when it may seem like there's big odds to face. Throughout Scripture, we see that the revelation and the movement of God does unfold over time and in new ways and in new places again and again, generation to generation. It says in Acts 13, Paul says, I think it was Paul, that David served God's purpose in his own generation. So King David, seeing him serving God's purpose in his generation, we have the Old Testament story of Esther who decided on risky advocacy with her husband, the king, when her people faced genocide. And she was called for such a time as this. The prophet Isaiah says, Behold, in the words of God, I am doing a new thing. Do you not see it? And we see Jesus innovating and riffing on the Jewish scriptures, living and dying in a way that brought them to life in a new way. The disciples on Pentecost, which we just read, speaking in new language that, so that other people could understand. Paul in the marketplace and a Mars Hill in Athens, speaking with philosophers, taking the message of Jesus into conversation with Greek philosophy. And in our own Reformed confessional tradition, which began with Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox on new shores around the world, they wrote powerful pieces and have written powerful pieces which we call confessions. Westminster Confession, the Barman Declaration that was written against Nazism in Germany. South African Confession that was written against apartheid. 
We're now considering adopting um, Martin, Luther's, uh, Martin Luther King's letter to the white church, letter from a Birmingham jail, as part of our confession, book of confessions. These documents that are written time and time again to say, now, in this moment, this is what we hear God saying to us. This is what we think it means to be faithful. And so now, what is the Spirit doing? Phyllis Tickle said in a book that she wrote almost 20 years ago that the church holds a rummage sale every 500 years. <laughs> and we're at another 500 years since the Reformation. This is a new moment. And if you didn't know it 20 years ago, we've got to know it now. After the last two years, the pandemic, division, wars and rumors of war, rapid changes in technology, the question of just postmodern, what's after this age we've all lived in and absorbed? And I think that the church holds this question for us just as our church calendar invites us to ask it every year on Pentecost. This year, as we look at gun violence and racial violence and mental health and the pandemic and the war, we ask ourselves, Spirit, where are you moving now? Where do we need to speak new languages? Who needs to hear the love of God in a language we don't yet speak? I have a friend who's doing TikTok pastoring, and I haven't had the guts yet, but it's actually amazing the amount of people that show up at this little church in Ohio because he's on TikTok doing messages saying, God loves you and the world isn't the same without you. What languages don't we yet speak? It's time to, uh, for us to ask for boldness and new capacities, and new freshness. In the Pentecost scripture for today, the followers of Jesus are gathered. There's not very many of them, I imagine. They're afraid of what was outside their four walls, afraid of what it might take to leave those walls. They felt paralyzed. And maybe sometimes we feel the same way. Someone told me that Churches have lost, on the average, 30 to 50% of their attendance over the last two years, and people are re-navigating their priorities. It's a frightening time in some ways. This face thing, you know, is important to us, but we're not sure if it's going to work outside of these walls. And yet these disciples, they didn't get shoved out the door on their own. They didn't just get pushed out and said, you know, now go for it. The Spirit came to meet them in that room. And I wonder if we trust that the Spirit will meet us too, right where we are, to give us new dreams, to give us new languages of faith. I think the biggest obstacle in the way of the Spirit is often believing that it's all up to us. I love that, what Paul said in Romans 8. So don't you see we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent. <laughs> There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's Spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. As Americans, and especially as residents of the peninsula, we live and breathe do-it-yourself. <laughs> Just try harder, work more, push. We think we can make it all happen. It gives us a sense of control. But we're invited to let go of control, I think, and see what God is doing and the trust that the Spirit will give us enough to keep moving forward. So where is Pentecost personal, perpetual, and possible for you? Where is it personal, perpetual, and possible for us? I think we can allow ourselves to be surprised and moved. So today, the invitation for you is to 
pray is to open your heart to take this possibility into yourself and in the next few moments uh, we're going to be praying with our feet but before we do that i'd like to invite the choir and bells to come and give us a moment to reflect on the words we've heard and where we may go from here
beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, next week I'll be kind of talking about, you know, where we've been as a church and how um, and where I think we are in moving forward. But um, this morning we want to just kind of give you a chance to enter into where we feel called to be prayerfully by walking around um, this sanctuary in the next few moments. And the first thing I want to, um, will invite you to is to um, go, well, you can go in whatever uh, order you want, but I'm going to let you know about the, the back wall here. And so as session and staff have been listening to where we feel called to go, we've been really following, I think, what uh, is the definition of discernment, which is Frederick Buechner's quote, to listen to your deep hunger and the world's deep, your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger. So where does the world really, where is it hungry? Where is it looking for more of God's love? And then where is our gladness? Who are we as a church and people in this church? And how can we meet those? So we've come up with, with four ways that we think we want to do that. And these are ways that are in support of our value of being outward focused, of loving the world outside. The first one is wholehearted partnership. And this is where all of us come in. And to, to really to be and own this place, to not just have it be my place or the session's place or the staff's place, but that this is your church where you are become excited and are a participant and an owner of what is happening here. The thing I hear so often about people who visit this is like, it's, it's not what you think. <laughs> Faith is not what you think. We're talking about a God that may not be what you think. This is a different kind of space, of a faith space. And so, so we want to continue to grow into a community where we are owning that more and more, where we are all grabbing a cup of coffee for somebody who comes here or sitting down with someone or inviting folks to join us in the Redwood Grove, not in some sense of having an agenda, but that we believe that being a part of this place is what is going to help us all build a more loving world, quite simply, and that we do need the sustenance to keep moving forward in our lives. So you're going to be invited to start at that transforming partnerships place and to just take a rock and hold it and pray and then to go to the next one which is kids and youth and families and this has been on the vpc list since i came since before i came but how do we become a place where kids and students and families can connect and heal and grow and thrive and that's why we've hired Naomi Kinsman as a curator, because we're not just saying, okay, you all come here and we'll, we'll be with you. We're, we're asking Naomi to go out and connect with the families and help us figure out how to connect with families and kids in our area in a way that's meaningful and helpful and speaks their language. We've been working more with PBTC to think about how can we connect with the kids that are on our campus every week. That's why you see a lot more benches out. You see a lot more places for people to sit and be and hang out. Um, that's kids, youth, and families. So take another rock, hold it, say a prayer. As we move on, we have arts and worship. You, some of you have heard me say that Mary Oliver has this wonderful poem where she says, when Jesus preached, one or two of the people there felt their souls slip forth. And I don't know what you felt when the choir and the bells just played, but you might have felt your soul slip forth a little bit. That's what we're looking for in how we express ourselves in worship and the arts here, because we believe that's when a transformation happens. So church is one of the best places for that to happen. Every week, we curate a Sunday morning experience, and we want to keep moving on the strengths of how this place has always been a soul place and move into what this new season is inviting us to. But we also want to engage artists. 
We want to invite them to come in for artist residencies. We want to bring in new generations of worship leaders to learn and help us to grow. We want to invite people to express themselves creatively. So this is all behind this arts and worship space that nourish, inspire, challenge, and expand the soul. The last one is transforming partnerships that maximize our collective capacity to build a more loving world. We did that last week with the beginning of our partnership with St. Mark in East Palo Alto. We're talking about how we can partner more with Stanford and the town of Portola Valley. Who is it that we want to bring in and how can we maximize and make each other better? And this is important for me to say is that this isn't all about just the VPC brand. This is about working together with others who we share our heart to build a more loving world, about distributed and shared ownership in that work. So take a trip along the back and then you'll receive a little bag to place your, your pieces of glass in and a quote to take home and reflect. And then over here, you're welcome to, to help us create a prayer candle, and Carrie will be there to help us write prayers and to light that today. Over here, you're invited to, to embody the spirit of what we want to do, to be a place where we are giving and receiving to each other. So Rita's going to invite you, if there's something that you would like to give, you can write something you want to give. So maybe it's something you have left over at your house, Maybe it's, I would like to give an hour to listen to someone's story. Maybe it's, I have an awesome soup recipe I'd love to make and share with you. And maybe then there's also something you'd like to receive. I need someone to listen to my story. I need a place to stay. I have a, an adult son that could use a call, whatever it is. And we'll, we'll use this for the next few weeks to, to trade some tags and help each other live in that kind of community that we see in that early church in Acts. And then uh, two members of our sessions executive team, uh, Ginger Holt and Leanne Shell, will be here in the front to offer communion to you. And we do have actual bread today for the first time, which is very exciting, and little cups. But um, we also have the sanitized cups if you still just want to play it safe. You're welcome to do that. So. This world needs base camp, and we need each other to build a more loving world. So let's take the next 10 to 15 minutes to walk around, explore. If there's something you heard that you're excited about and you want to share it with somebody, feel free. Um, or you just need to you know, walk around and then sit quietly for a bit. You're welcome to do that as Barbary plays the harp. But let's pray with our feet together. that first verse again. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. Builders must be Courage, courage, people don't 
day our hope grows deeper. Every day our hope grows deeper. Every day our hope grows deeper. Every day our hope grows deeper. People must have hope. And back to we are building. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. We are building up a new world. Builders must be. Would you pray with me this prayer in the bulletin? Let's read it together. Holy God, who comes to us in breath, visits us from the throne of heaven, and sets us aflame with amazement and joy, you open our paths to new visions and guide our feet deeper into your wisdom. Give us faith to trust your presence. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, which is hymn number 408, not 480. There's a sweet, sweet spirit, hymn number 408. that you received if you were in the back says this community is like a large mosaic each little piece seems so insignificant one piece is bright red another cold blue or dull green another warm purple another sharp yellow another shining gold some look precious some ordinary some look valuable others worthless some look gaudy others delicate We can do little with them as individual stones except compare them and judge their beauty and value. 
When, however, these little stones are brought together in one big mosaic, portraying the face of Christ, who would ever question the importance of any one of them? If one of them, even the least spectacular one, is missing, the face is incomplete. Together in the one mosaic, each little stone is indispensable and makes a unique contribution to the glory of God. That's community, a fellowship of little people who together make God visible in the world. This is our invitation, and this is where we think the Holy Spirit meets us. Thanks so much for being here, for participating, and I'm really looking forward to more of this conversation in the next month. May you know the Spirit's presence with you go, as you go into this world and as we together build a more loving world. Amen. Amen.